Thank you for tuning into Advanced TV History, where we strive to elevate the importance of TV women by telling their stories. We know how seeing ourselves on television impacts our own growth and confidence. There's gold and inspiration in the decades of great work by underappreciated, often forgotten, significant, talented women. Thanks for listening and sharing this podcast. I'm your host, Cynthia Bemis Abrams. Listeners, our research into Judy Garland's TV series that aired from 1963 to 1964 is a fantastic look at the power of the entertainment industry. And it goes without saying that child stars, particularly those who can act and are musical performers, have an altogether different experience. It's not something that we as a society can be proud of, as Judy's is just one of many stories to bear out the horrors. Now, one theme that loyal listeners recognize from recent Advanced TV History episodes is how TV network decision makers, usually men, acted in ways or have protected cultures that undermined the careers of women. We're talking strong, accomplished women like Linda Bloodworth Thomason, the wildly successful showrunner of the late 80s and early 90s. Shoulder pads, designing women. It was a fun episode to produce, but a really sad story. Tragic. News icon Ann Curry, who instead of helping us start the day as the anchor of NBC's The Today Show, is working on important but certainly lower-profile projects on PBS. Their situations can be attributed directly to men. And only recently have American women begun putting together the pieces, even of their own lives, of cultures that have allowed decades of sexism, harassing, hazing, and ageism. Each new lesson arrives via first-hand accounts. The result of the modern movements that we've been experiencing these last few years, Me Too, which is all about battling sexual assault and inappropriate behaviors in the workplace across so many industries, and Time's Up, which focuses more on the disproportionate share of power and pay and mobility experienced not only by women but people of color. So the backstory of Judy Garland's TV series easily broke out into five podcast episodes when, here it is in 2019, we really start looking at the whole story of this series. And at first, it all seemed pretty cut and dried. It's Judy. It's a bunch of facts. It's a bunch of books. But in having a tremendous conversation with Chicago's own Angela Ingersoll, who is one of the few women in America telling Judy's story and who sings a jukebox of American standards from a time when the country was a bit more united, well, we hit some real common ground. The Judy Garland Show, which is iconic to say the least. It makes the most sense that we talk about an iconic TV series by somebody who really knows the background and is now living in a sense, the very work product that came out of one of America's most talented, wow, talented women singers who made it to TV. So she, Judy Garland was a fantastic star of stage and screen and, and by stage, that is the concert stage, not necessarily the performing stage. Screen and TV and The Wizard of Oz. Ugh. And The Wizard of Oz became this iconic movie that was on TV every single year while we were all growing up. And so that's one of those common bonds that we as Americans and throughout the world have in common. And it's what led everybody, except my mother, to love Judy Garland. So I am thrilled to have in the studio today Angela Ingersoll, who I met in here in Chicago, she is a she too is a veteran of the stage, the the American stage now we can say. So Angela was doing this performance that is entitled it's a, an entire show Get Happy. She's going to tell you about it and I just am welcoming welcoming Angela Ingersoll. Thank you so much. I'm terribly excited to talk Judy. I will talk on and on about whoever will listen to uh my my favorite you favorite have, subject. You in the have world. met your match. <laughs> oh, good, good, good. Here we are. <laughs> and can I just say that we are women talking about Judy Garland? Do you, uh, you've done your research, and we are going to talk about the 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 tremendous research that is out there. The amount of information that will help us 
educate listeners about how influential that TV series was. Absolutely. And what what an important American artist she was and what an important uh, f- female artist she was. Really, there's so much about her uh, being a pioneer as a woman and as a woman who did not sexualize herself to be loved by her audiences that uh, has fascinated me my entire life. There's a, a childlike sense of play she never let go of that makes her a, um, a, a woman really ahead of her time, I think. Angela is more than a Judy Garland scholar and fan. She's performed the Judy part in the biographical theater production End of the Rainbow, which is a rather sad story about Judy's last months. Now, listeners, if you also start hearing about a 2019 film entitled Judy that stars Renee Zellweger, please know that it's a close cousin to End of the Rainbow, which I saw on stage in Minneapolis a few years ago. There's also word that a Judy bio musical is coming to Broadway, and it would seem that others are finally realizing that there's a lot to learn by telling the story of Judy's accomplishments and also how she was treated. So hers is a complicated story that involves American celebrity, the entertainment business, addiction, money, and trust, and also talent. Two years before her death, Judy sat with Barbara Walters, who at that time was with NBC's Today Show, and was joined by her children, Lorna and Joey. And this helps put into context, coming out of the one season of the Judy Garland Show, here's where her mind was. I did a quote recently, and you said, I wish people would stop talking about my comebacks and, and my unhappiness. I have, have had so many happier days. I have so many happy days now. Do you recall saying this was just in the paper? Yes, recently. well, it's true, you know. I, I've had, uh, maybe it will distress a lot of people, but I've had an awfully nice life. I really have had. I think it will surprise a lot of people who kind of like to think of you as a... Tragedy. You know, the poor little rich girl. The, 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 well, the, never the, rich, not, just not poor. That, you know, in the same time. <laughs> and the woman who had everything and yet, you know, wasn't yeah, happy. Um, what are the things that bring you the... I don't even have to ask you. I was going to say, what are the things that bring you so much happiness today and you're hugging one of them right now? Well, uh, first of all, my two friends here, myself, my oldest daughter, my son-in-law, my future, my past, my present, and my audiences. And that ain't bad. <laughs> no, it's not bad. And I count myself among those of your audience who, who love you so much, so I'm doing this interview with great joy for me. Thank you, Barbara. Looking forward to being a grandmother? That's going to happen one of these can't days. can't wait. Really? I can't wait. From the silver screen to TV, how did Judy come to have a self-titled TV show, and how could that be a bad thing? How could it have failed? Angela gives us a quick rundown, which actually has also been chronicled in great detail by many biographers over the years. The most comprehensive one is from noted author Coyne Stephen Sanders, who wrote an entire book just about the series. And this was a phoenix rising from the ashes. She had just a few years before been told that she uh, may never work, may never walk again because she was hospitalized and so very ill. She rises up as a phoenix from the ashes, gives this phenomenal performance at Carnegie Hall, and then um, pop culture couldn't get enough of her. Though it was at such a time of change in America, you know, rock and roll is coming, uh, but still Judy was quite quite prominent as an American artist. Carnegie Hall was recorded by Capitol Records as an album and became a big Grammy winner, certified uh, gold, uh, never has been out of print, was such a huge album that CBS reached out and said, hey, we'd like to like to get in on a little bit of this success and offered Judy a televised concert to try to show Americans what it must have been like to be at Carnegie Hall that night. And that first televised concert special of hers um, that followed up Carnegie Hall in 1961, she had a couple of pretty good guests on that concert. It, it was, good. It was yeah. Frank and Dean, you know, just a couple of friends <laughs> stopped by. And it was wildly successful. Judy Garland was suddenly the most popular person on television. Mm-hmm. Judy had never... Uh, done television before. And in fact, it's the Judy Garland from this time period that Angela focuses her own show, Get Happy, on. In the early 60s, from the Carnegie Hall concert through the 26 episodes of the Judy Garland show, 
Judy bridged a transitioning America, feeling the first adult growing pains of the baby boom and the civil rights movement and how that would open up to the women's movement. So in 1963 and 1964, known and loved, Judy would deliver big. But first, let's understand 50s Judy. Ah, 50s Judy. Her film career in the 50s revealed the wear of her addictions, the ones that were brought on during her years of service. (laughs) She'd call it indentured servitude at MGM. Rigorous schedules for months on end. The spotlights shine. This was movie making in the 50s, and it was all too bright. It was too fast. It was a lot of pressure. Her marriage to Sid Luft and the economics of touring concerts, however, enabled her to rebuild her career out on the road, out where she could just go out and do what she did best. Now, in the 50s, Judy did have some exposure on TV, but she thought of it, she she had the whole thought that TV was a last resort for her career. What else would there be if she failed at TV? Well, then there there was no other way to rebuild. So by all accounts, she knew that there was not the financial incentive that balanced out to her the the cost-benefit analysis that it would take for her to sustain the pressure to perform and consistently look good on 50s TV. Other than the annual showing of The Wizard of Oz, which was indeed an annual event, there was a 1951 appearance and a 1955 Ford Star Jubilee TV show. And let me tell you, it's available on YouTube, and it is eerie. And it's a black and white clip of Judy singing Somewhere Over the Rainbow. And she's in her hobo costume. This was one of her acts. She had been very anxious about doing the Ford Star Jubilee segment. This was about the time when Lorna was very young. Joey had just been born. Um, Judy was anxious. She was so anxious that she overdosed on sleeping pills the morning of the broadcast. Sid Luft helped her out of the drugged state, however it is that he knew how to do this, and this is all documented in, across a couple different books, first-hand accounts. And realizing that Somewhere Over the Rainbow is a song that Judy could perform on autopilot, you watch it today and you see that set array of facial expressions and pauses and cadence, and you've seen her perform it over time and time again, both in 1938 for The Wizard of Oz, as well as in 1955. And it is something to behold, that there is video to support this story of how she could overdose and come back and perform on TV is a tremendous insight into this woman and the power of addiction. I encourage you to see those four minutes of video on YouTube excerpted from the PBS special of 1985, and the link is in the show notes of this podcast. Now, I raise these 50s bits of TV trivia almost to help put into context how it factored into her experience, her preparation, how it is that she ended up saying in 1962, yes, I want to do TV. She was a very high-maintenance woman. She had been a working star all of her life, and the long-time use of pills and alcohol messed with her appearance. Her weight went up and down. Her skin would look, her eyes, you, you know. Technology for TV was still evolving, and the production pace was so much faster than for the movies. It was different, and she wasn't comfortable yet with it. So in 1956, the General Electric Theater offered up a 30-minute music anthology episode that would feature her, and it suffered all sorts of last-minute changes, and she was under stress, and that she just sort of would collapse. And it resulted in reviews that basically called out the fact that it was an off performance. Maybe the critics were quick to call it an off performance because the critics loved to shine the spotlight most brightly on child stars. But indeed, it's the genesis of her TV series, or at least the way she would have liked to do it, sticking close to the music. Live 
Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Good evening. I have a feeling that there's much too much talk going on in the world today, so you're going to get very little from me. But I'm, I'm a singer, and I just like to sing, so why don't we go? Come on. Listeners, 50s Judy turned into 60s Judy. How did that happen? 1960, returning to her singing roots, she performed at London's Palladium Theater. The Judy at Carnegie Hall album, which was recorded in 1961, topped Billboard's Top 40 chart for 13 weeks, remaining in the Top 40 for 73 weeks. The album won five Grammys, including Album of the Year and Female Vocalist. Guess who was on top? Her 1962 televised special, which was CBS's most popular special of that TV season, included guests Frank Sinatra and Dean Martin. It was big, according to Sanders' book on the series. Kay Thompson, who was perhaps Judy's closest woman colleague, was quoted as saying that Judy conceived and selected her concert program, helped design her wardrobe, and had input into the musical arrangements and supervised the lighting. By this time, Judy's road to TV was getting green lights all over the place. In late 1962, all three networks were in talks with Judy's agents about her headlining a series. Garland had finally come around to the idea that a series, actually, you know, after years on the road in the 50s, that a series held the best chance for a serious payday. She was looking at at least a a take of 20-plus million dollars per year. That would also include home life stability for herself and Lorna and Joey and a chance for her to put on the kind of show that she liked to do and did best. Now, Sanders wrote in his book, quote, Garland would be CBS's biggest catch for the 1963-64 season, joining the already signed headliners Danny Kaye, Carol Burnett, who was signed for a series of specials, Phil Silvers in a new half-hour sitcom, and George C. Scott in the gritty, realistic drama East Side, West Side. End quote. Listeners, CBS, however, was banking on Judy beating those big names, those those rookies, and topping the Nielsen ratings. Listeners, what you need to know is she was put up against Bonanza. So we've just talked a little <laughs> bit about the fact that, so yeah. Sunday night. You probably all, remember, all of, some of you, it was on <laughs> Sunday nights at night. All yeah. of young America, half of America was under the age of 18, pretty much. Or right? at least the ones who were watching TV. And of course, Bonanza is a big hit. And it's also filled with men that, mm-hmm. you know, the and, and so it was a very, it was a macho sort of family fair show. And they put, you well, got to wonder whether or not it, that was part of it. Was, you also had one TV in the household, if you were lucky, you had one TV in the household. And who was in charge of what channel was on? It was, I'm sure it was father was in charge. And father was going to be perhaps more interested and on watching Bonanza over on NBC because these were stories that that he could relate to Mm -hmm. more than um, an arts entertainment program Mm -hmm. because we traditionally find that the ticket buying audience for art entertainment programs are are largely women. So that's who they're marketed towards. Given given the demographic then of how TV was how TV was consumed and how decisions were made. I don't know that we have an equivalent today of a series that was as popular and influential and a time slot that was as As family oriented as Bonanza. I certainly can't think, uh, you know, our entertainment nowadays is so very fragmented because there were three channels to tune into um, on one TV, right? the, the, (laughs) The choices were limited. So one program could have a much greater influence. Mm -hmm. We don't have coffee or we don't have coffee talk kind of shows. We don't have water cooler type of shows now because our entertainment is segmented because you can go in a million different directions to find what you want. There isn't a unifying force Mm -hmm. in entertainment any longer. We're all treated like demographics now and the demographics keep getting more and more specialized. Mm -hmm. And it's harder to reach across an aisle and find one another now in our public discourse, partially because even in entertainment, we can't bond over who is the greatest American singer right now. Mm-hmm. The per episode budget was slated to be about $150,000 to $165,000 per episode. 
That's big dough. That was big dough in 1962. And Judy's company, King's Row Production, would own the final product. She'd be responsible for paying salaries and costs, which meant that there was a financial incentive to her being on time. Best efforts first. Rewrites cost money, as do crews sitting around waiting for the talent to arrive. They put all the responsibility on Judy's shoulders to basically, I think, keep her in line, and that that seems appropriate. Her contract was considered the strongest ever, you should know, at least according to Variety magazine, which maintained that a contract for Garland, not the network, to cancel the shows before all 26 episodes were produced and aired. That was a big deal. So in 1962-1963, what other women associated with TV were wielding that kind of power? I think it kind of comes down to Lucille Ball, who was indeed a big fan of Judy's. In fact, few big screen names had successfully moved over to TV, Lucille Ball being just one of the very few, because it was considered such a step down from film. It was an even rarer transition for women to make that. Barbara Stanwyck, The Big Valley, though it's rumored that she only did The Big Valley for the big money. Betty Davis and Joan Crawford would have loved to do something like The Big Valley. They were pulling paychecks for like one-off dramatic appearances and being on the talk show circuit. Lucille Ball, yes, was building the empire at Desilu, creating Star Trek. Helen O'Connell, maybe you've heard that name. She was the Today Show, and Dinah Shore was holding down the talk show circuit. That was about it. That's who had come off of the silver screen over to TV and none of them had walked onto the TV soundstage with the 40-plus-year career like Garland's. And none of them, alive or in death, went on to become a fixation of men who have embraced and interpreted her legend and legacy. Angela and I discussed this. What I find intriguing, and the reason why you're sitting in this seat, is because you are a woman Hmm. voicing the life and the challenges and the struggles and the tremendous triumphs of Judy Garland. Because when we think about all of those books, Mm -hmm. other than Lorna Luft, and I think, um, oh shoot, the woman, Ann Edwards from Mm -hmm. the seventies, not many of those books were written by women. Is that right? That's true. And also uh, not many performers who tribute Judy Garland have been women. There have been quite a lot of men (laughs) who have done beautiful and moving Jim Bailey, of course, being the, the most prominent uh, performances to keep alive her legacy in in a way that tells us about the time we live in now, you know, and, and there have been uh, certainly wonderful male artists who have done that. And it's been a while or maybe forever, if I if I may say, since we've seen um, a female artist step into uh, Judy's shoes in a way that was important to uh, our time now. So I'm very blessed to get to be that person who has uh, been sent this calling, it feels like. It feels like a calling to it, me. It feels uh-huh. like a calling to me, too. And I feel like now is the time. Yeah. We need to we need to celebrate American women's talent who got us here the women who got us here and we're going to talk about some of the ceilings that she broke through some of the the doors she busted through Mm -hmm. and sat down and did not move her tiny four foot eleven frame (laughs) did not move and so um she really leveraged a lifetime of very hard work and and i admire you for also bringing that 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 work ethic to you know everything that that you present in your get happy show Thank and we're going to get back to talking about get happy mm-hmm. are the values that that really brought Judy forward that that came out of Hollywood that even though we as midwesterners mm-hmm. um we saw it we didn't really understand the whole Hollywood scene the the life that she led on the backside but she she very much was a part of the great american century known as the 20th century yeah so, and the music of the 20th century uh, it, it also is something that's still so important to uh, American culture in the 21st century. I think the music of the 20th century, particularly all these great standards that uh, that Judy was singing, the oldies of her day and the new songs that were written for her at that time, I feel like these songs in the 21st century are a currency for audiences to feel like we have something in common. You know, we uh, all know the words to something like Over the Rainbow. Listeners. Advanced TV history's focus on this important TV series is partly how the series came off, a study in one more woman getting labeled difficult to work with, as well as some of the most treasured moments 
that will have ever happened because the TV camera was rolling. Guests, songs, moments. That's what this series of podcasts is all about. And along the way, the medicine we know to be these lessons that inform our feminism today reminds us to be on our guard and to measure our trust of others. Stay tuned for the rest of our examination of the Judy Garland show. But rest assured (laughs) that we'll throw in some of those treasured clips. Also, you should know that due to copyright clearance, we cannot offer musical clips, which obviously is the, is the, true, the true treasure of the series. Hard to believe that behind that self-confidence and humor was someone so yearning for constant affirmation. She was indeed a classic raconteur. She could never be serious for very long, as this Australian reporter experienced in 1964. <laughs> I've done every job they've thrown at me. <laughs> All right, why do you do it? Because why, I why like you dry it. yourself so much? Because I was born to do that. To work and try to entertain. Take people's minds off their troubles for a while. If I can. And where do you drive? Why are you looking at me this way? <laughs> well, I can't see you any other way. <laughs> You haven't blinked once. (laughs) I have, believe me. What gives you your satisfaction when you're singing, when you have an audience? Their approval. Is this what you live for? Yes. Do you live for other things? Money. Anything else? I don't think so. No. What do you, what would you sing? Your children? Well, that money's for my children. Listeners, this has been a great topic to transition to a season format. Judy Garland, there's just so much to think about. The decision to go in this direction is largely due to the enormous feedback I received from you, saying that what makes Advanced TV history so distinct from other podcasts are the moments when we take a close view of TV history and then see how it connects to today. That's the blend of sociology, gender studies, history, and business that few other podcasts offer. So no matter how you came to listen to this episode or any of the past episodes, know that you can find us other places as well. We try hard to make our work available for convenient listening, and you know we'd be incredibly grateful if you'd take a few minutes to share this show with someone who might enjoy this fresh take on Judy Garland. Even more so if, in sharing this podcast, you open the door, the whole door, to podcasts, which really are just audio programs, like listening to the radio, sort of, to someone who otherwise finds the idea of listening to a podcast to be complicated, downright intimidating. Help that person. As a matter of fact, just say to them, Find the Just Press Play button of Advanced TV Herstory at the tvherstory.com website. Or go to Pandora and and search Advanced TV Herstory. We're even on YouTube. On social media, you can find us. Our Twitter handle is TV Herstory. And on Instagram, Advanced TV Herstory. And as always, our email is advancedtvherstory at gmail.com. For this important season on Judy's show, The 60s Judy, we owe a great thank you to Angela Ingersoll. She brings her love and knowledge of Judy everywhere, including our studio here in Chicago. Such tremendous energy and heart. Ugh. We wish her the very best as her show, Get Happy, builds its audience, travels the country, And we really hope to have her back here at Advanced TV Herstory for more fun. If you want to know more about the Judy Garland Show, the series, I highly recommend Coyne Stephen Sanders' book, The Judy Garland Show, Rainbow's End. I've quoted Sanders' research and direct quotes from that book, though all those interviews, that are now going on 30 years of age. Wow. Wow. This is, we're coming up on the anniversary of The Wizard of Oz and of Judy Garland's series. Ugh, a lot of really great stuff out there. Okay, 
as we leave and 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 finish this episode of Advanced TV Herstory's look at the Judy Garland show, I have to, of course, give credit behind the scenes to two people who make this show what it is. Jen Eads of Brassy Broadcasting, who serves as audio editor, and Catherine Yang, who is associate producer and video director. Very talented, true believers in the work we're doing. And that background music? That's Jazzer's Take Me Higher, which you can find at freemusicarchive.com. I leave you with this. In 1963, Judy Garland said in an interview, You really want to know why I'm tackling a weekly television series? Because CBS is letting me be myself, letting me be a whole, total, complete person. Listeners, be yourself. Be whole. Give it your all. Thanks for listening, and thank you for recommending us to others. I'm your host, Cynthia Demas Abrams.